Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast. Podcast focus on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their career and lives. In this episode, I talked to Alexis Clark, who you're used to hearing from as our show's co-host. But instead, in honor of International Women's Day, will be talking to us about the nonprofit organization she works with to enhance the diversity of women in STEM. At EMI, we believe in diversity, and that is why we enjoy celebrating Women's Day. International Women's Day is celebrated in many countries around the world. It's a day when women are recognized for their achievements without regards to division, whether national, ethnic, linguistic, cultural, economic, or political. The theme for this year's Women's Day is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. The theme celebrates the tremendous efforts by women and girls around the world in shaping a more equal future and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in structural engineering from UC San Diego. And now for those of you that might not know my co-host Alexis, I'd like to introduce her. Alexis Clark is a product manager at Hilti North America and is responsible for the development and growth of the chemical anchoring product portfolio in the US and Canada. Alexis holds a professional engineering license in the state of Texas. Alexis is passionate about engineering, engaging the next generation of STEM professionals, and empowering women. She has been published in Structure Magazine and Texas Civil Engineering Magazine, delivered presentations at various industry conferences, and is an avid infrastructure advocate. She has held a variety of leadership roles throughout the American Society of Civil Engineers, local, state, and national levels. Alexis currently serves a three-year term on the ASCE SEI Structures Congress National Committee. She is currently serving her third year as president slash chair of the board of directors for the nonprofit, The Gems Camp, whose mission is to build confidence in undeserved and underrepresented teen girls, Black and Latinx in STEM. Alexis will complete her master's in business administration at Auburn University in December 20. 21 and received her bachelor's in civil engineering from the university of texas at austin now let's jump into our conversation of the week Alexis, welcome to the show i finally get to interview you i'm excited about that and to listen some more about uh, your projects that you've been doing, but many of our listeners already know you and I gave you an intro already, but in your own words, can you please tell our listeners what, uh, what are the things that you do on a daily basis? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'll kind of dissect those into a few different buckets. So the first is my job. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the product manager of chemical anchors for the US and Canada in North America for Hilti. And it's, it's kind of funny because I technically have gone to the dark side of marketing, so I'm no longer in, a, in an engineering or technical role specifically, um, but I have a lot of engineers ask me if I still feel like an engineer, and I still introduce myself as one when I meet someone new in the professional uh, networking arena. And the reason I say that is because, you know, anyone who's on, who's listening to this and who have worked with a chemical anchor before know that it's a pretty highly engineered product. Um, so while I am responsible for driving, you know, development of new product, and while I'm responsible for growing sales of those, of those products here in the U S and Canada, um, most of the decisions that I'm making on a daily basis are very much, they require my engineering background in order to be able to make the right choices for what our customers are, those contractors who are actually installing anchors in the field. And ultimately you guys, the engineers are, are going to need in order to design these products or with these products and. Um, and feel comfortable with them being used on your job site. So I, I still get to do plenty of engineering, even though I'm not necessarily designing anything, which is just pretty fun. Um, but yeah, daily, daily work can be anything from, you know, looking at different forecasting, uh, just looking at markets, how product lines are growing or are not growing, um, lots of quantitative analysis. Um, I'm often working and, and actually speaking a lot to either the contractor or the engineer to understand more about what you need or interesting pain points you might be experiencing currently. Um, so I do a lot of just speaking to people and I get to listen a lot and, and learn. 
Um, it's very interesting getting to deal with, you know, not only customers here in Texas where we're located, but people on the West Coast who are dealing with seismic and COLA and um, the CDC and all these fantastic things that don't affect my, my local uh, engineers or, you know, uh, people who are up in the Northeast or in Canada, totally different, uh, totally different code regulations up there. So I, I learn a lot. And then most of the time I get to kind of soak up all that information and then I'm formulating solutions, whether it's for an external customer like you guys, the engineer, or our R&D teams who are located in Germany and Switzerland, uh, because we're always trying to, of course, develop what the next anchor might look like. And those decisions directly come from the feedback that I get from y'all. So it's, it's pretty fun. I like it most days. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks, Alexis. I know it's even though it's more of the higher up type of, of work, but I, what I always tell people, I mean, that's what's so great about being an engineer. It's, it's problem solving, whether you're a designer designing or doing a calc or a, or a more senior engineer, or even more the, the project management, product management that you're doing, it's, it's still the same thing. It's, you have the technical aspects to know what you're talking about, but then you also, now it gets into more of the people solving skills and, end of the day, it's still problem solving. I think uh, for us, that's what makes, you know, engineering a, a great career path, because that's what I always love about it. You're always learning new things and you're always problem solving. Absolutely. So. And I would make a quick plug. I actually wrote an article recently for the Texas Civil Engineering Magazine about what it's like to be an engineer in a product management position. Um, and if anyone is listening and you're kind of interested in using your engineering skills for something other than design, if you're looking to shake things up, or if you're just curious about what else, what else is out there, um, I think that article is a pretty good a uh, pretty good job of kind of breaking down how you can use those problem solving uh, skills to to help um, an organization in, in a marketing or sales branch. Awesome. Let's let's link that in the in the description below. Let's I, I think that'll be a good article to, to plug in. Uh, Alexis, I did want to get and talk about your involvement in the GEMS Camp program online. Can you tell us more about that and uh, what Gem, GEMS Camp is and their mission and how you were introduced to it? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's that's a, a really big question. Um, I'll first talk about the Gems Camp and then how I, I came to be involved. So, what's so cool about the Gems Camp is it really is a um, a very niche organization, but its impact is huge. So um, I know a lot of us are maybe familiar with with diversity and STEM conversation. We've maybe you know been to an SE three um, meeting or we we've, we've looked at the survey results. Um, and in general, there seems to be this kind of pull, push around students to get into STEM and making sure that that's a diverse pipeline. But what's so unique about the GEMS Camp is that um, the GEMS Camp stands for Girls Interested in Engineering, Math, and Science, our GEMS. We actually refer to our girls who go through the program as our GEMS. Um, this program is very focused on the most, some of the most diverse groups you can have within, uh, within, within an organization in, in North America. And that is, we're looking to build confidence in underserved and underrepresented teen girls. Um, so this is really, just to break it down for our audience, we're focusing on Black and Latina girls. Um, and most of these girls come from low uh, income or socioeconomically disadvantaged students. So about 68% 60, of our girls that come through actually qualify for free or reduced lunch. Um, it's 100% Black and Latina girls. Um, and we we really, we have a great group of, of, of ladies that join us. and um, What's so fantastic about this program is that, you know, you, you think about the fact that we're not only trying to increase the variety of, of racial and ethnic, uh, ethnical backgrounds in STEM, but we're also trying to increase the number of women that are in STEM. So this is really a, a focused version of both of those initiatives in one. Um, and the group, uh, the age group that we work with is very specific and very intentional because as many of you may be very familiar with uh, the National Science Foundation or many other surveys, when we look at when girls start to trail off in math and science and their not only their confidence, but also their performance in those, those uh, studies, it tends to be around middle school, right? That's when we start to hit puberty. That's when there's kind of this understanding of gender roles. Um, and that's, that's statistically when we see um, these, these girls going through middle school, their grades start to um, diverge from their male counterparts. And that's when they start to believe, you know, maybe math and science aren't for me. They're, they're, they're told that in their classes, they start to have all these um, small uh, microaggressions that, that basically confirm math and science aren't for you. So we're very intentional about who we go after and the age group that we work with. Um, and what's so cool also about this organization is, you know, when we look at other programs for girls, we, we think of things like Girl Scouts or Girls Inc, which are general education or leadership um, organizations 
Maybe we look further at a group like Girl Start, which is programming for girls. Um, I know I did that when I grew up, uh, when I was younger. Um, but those aren't specific to increasing the diversity within women who pursue those, or girls who pursue those different STEM activities. And then we think of something so specific like Black Girls Code, which is a fantastic organization. But then we're really looking at a niche group that is Black girls and coding. So it's very much focused on the technical or technology aspect of STEM. Um, so we, we talked about our target audience and what our mission is, right? We're trying to bring confidence to these girls so they can pursue STEM careers. Um, what's interesting about our programming is that it's not just a STEM camp. It's not the same bread and butter you would get in other places around the US. Um, there are, because there are already all of these um, social cues that these girls have experienced throughout their life that say, this isn't necessarily a, a career you can pursue. This isn't going to your strengths. Um, you, a lot of these girls don't necessarily have a home environment that helps support them through this programming. Um, the beginning of our programming and throughout the entire course of it really does include those cultural cues. Um, it's a lot about learning and kind of self-reflecting on personal and institutional struggles that these girls face on a daily basis. Um, and we bring that into the conversation. So the programming really is not only focused on these girls, but making sure that they are, they, they're, they start the program by, by understanding that we are empathizing with their situation. And when you identify and, and address those risk factors and explain them to these girls and then bring in this cultural competency piece, you've actually already set the stage for learning to really be at its best. Once we set that stage, we then apply the rigor of really intense academics, math, science, technology, um, and a variety of different program um, aspects like well-being. We bring in self-defense. We talk about self-reflection and mental health. Um, we really do transform these girls over the amount of time that we work with them where they come out on the other end and they they have a newfound confidence in themselves. It's for a lot of these girls, it's the first time that they have met a group of peers who are academically minded, who are uh, ambitious. And it's it's just, it's the most amazing thing. I've been involved with, for five years now and every group of girls that I come through, that come through, it's just, it is this transformative experience and they all come out as butterflies at the end of it. It's just, it's so amazing to see. Um, I mentioned, you asked really quickly how I got involved. Um, I, like many other STEM professionals or engineers, um, I, I wanted to give my time, right? I like to spend time with kids. I like to get them excited about engineering. So I started in 2015 as just a, a mentor or a, a leader speaker, a role model um, for one of their lunchtime activities. So I came in, I talked about my job as a field engineer at Hilti at the time, and I shared with them my love of engineering. And I was so impressed with the girls at that point. And I, you know, I asked to stay in touch. I thought that the, the organization did a lot of really important work. Um, and I continued to do that over the next few years. And then in 2018, as their board was changing hands and, uh, and bringing, you know, kind of um, releasing old board members, there was an opportunity to get involved. Uh, it was my first board position. I am still learning quite a bit. <laughs> uh, this is now my third year as, as chair of the board. Um, I can still tell you it's, it's still very much my first board experience and I learn every single time what I'm supposed to be doing and, and how this works. Um, but it is, it's amazing to be on this side of it where I do get the chance to interact with the girls, but I'm more about how do I fuel this machine that's already so well fine-tuned? How do I step back? I, you know, they don't necessarily need to see my face up there. It's important that they see women in STEM, but it's more important that they see black and, and Latino women in STEM. So how can I step away from the stage, but make sure that all the lights are still going and make sure that the, the, the show can run um, and that we get more, more audience members in the seats, right? Yeah, exactly. I, that's one of the things that I got out of that was, I think that's great because what you were, I think what you mentioning was kind of the programming when you're growing up and your environment's so important. And if you're growing up in that type of environment, I think you were saying the social cues, I like to call it kind of the programming that you get when you're, when you're growing up, um, all those little things that add up. And I think that's so important that uh, organizations like, like GEMS kind of gets that programming out because if you don't see yourself in that future role especially when you're you know when you're a teenager when you're growing up then yeah it's really easy to just mentally shut down and shut that path off but well what seems really cool about gems is you're providing these role models where they can build that self-confidence it's like oh i see this uh one person who's doing uh something that's really great maybe engineering and science or, or stem and they can see themselves in it too. And that's that's all it takes is when you're 
uh, a little uh, when you're, you know, when you're still growing up or when you're going through your, your academics, that's all it takes, that little spark or that little yep. voice in your head that says, oh, these people are doing it. I can do it too. And literally yep. right there, that's when your, your life changes when, when something like that happens. And I think that's why it's so important for, for, for things like this, where Gems Camp, when, when you can instill that into uh, these young girls and, and get them on the, the right path and self-confidence uh, really absolutely the mentoring is that's that's what's so awesome about it and I agree yeah. I would say that there's actually I always say that there's two elements to that spark so you mentioned the spark so one is the representation I need to see someone who looks like me who is doing that thing that I want to do so that's always correct that is the first spark for me there's always a second spark if it's someone who is a mentor or a sponsor or something like that and they're your champion and they're the person who points directly at you and say I believe you can do this and if you have those two things, I think anyone can do anything. And, and you, you mentioned it perfectly. That's, that's just the problem is we don't have a lot of representatives and we don't have a lot of champions for these groups that don't typically have those resources. And what's what the long term about the volunteer stuff, too, is what I think what a lot of people don't get or if they don't volunteer is, you know, this is someone helped you out, whether you know it or not, throughout your career. And they were volunteering their time to, to help you out. And then it's when you grow up and once you, once you become successful and you have all the success, you look back and see who got you on this path. And then once you go through a path like this, then it can kind of feed that cycle of, hey, you were giving something or you were helped out. Now it's, uh, hopefully it's time that you can give back also to, to re keep repeating that cycle, so. Absolutely. And I think that's what you're focusing on now with uh, that leadership board position, uh, look, looking at the bigger picture. And Alexis, I did want to ask, why is this so important uh, in, in your own words about, about GEMS? So there's, there's a lot of reasons why this work is so important. And hopefully many of our listeners are also um, of the belief that diversity is important. Uh, we see in many studies that uh, when we have more diverse teams with more diverse perspectives, uh, the outcome and the results performance of that team is always going to be stronger than a team with more um, monotone perspectives, we'll say. Um, and so it is important that we have groups that do have these um, diverse experiences where they can bring different problem solving aspects to the table and, and bring those forward into a team environment. Um, I, I do want to share just a couple of really quick um, factoids about how this applies specifically to the structural engineering group. Um, I'm referencing the SE3 2020 survey results. Um, and I'm just going to bring up a couple of numbers that we can look at to help put this into perspective and why it matters to us in our job um, as, as in the industry of structural engineers. Um, so in 2020, the number, the percentage of female counterparts um, out of our entire survey group was at 24%. So for every one woman, there are three men in the same room. Um, and I can say I, I feel that very, <laughs> uh, I feel that a lot when I'm in the room and, and I'm not who we're talking about today. Uh, the other number I'm going to bring up is that of the survey respondents, there were 23% that were non-white or mixed race. Um, so that doesn't mean that they're, they don't have any white in them whatsoever, but it means that that's what we're really working with to, to, to show um, the, the breadth of, of racial and ethnic um, diversity within structural engineering. So we're very much a very white and very male industry. And part of the SE3 initiative is to help broaden and diversify and, and make up um, a group, uh, a workforce that really is reflective of the talent that's coming out of engineering schools, because we can look at, at the, um, at the makeup of the demographic makeup of these different engineering schools that are where we want to recruit our top talent. And we see that the numbers are a little bit better there. So there's some kind of gap between um, our collegiate levels, our academic levels, and um, those who are actually in industry. And the final number I want to share is that um, make, uh, what makes up that 23% that are non-white or mixed race 6% are Latinx colleagues. So we do have 6% um, that are Latina and Latino, which is fantastic. 1.3 of all survey respondents were Black or African American. So 7.3% of our entire workforce is made up of these two groups that are pretty heavily, you know, they, they make up a, a fair percentage or proportion of the American people. And again, we when we say we want to, you know, start to diversify our workforce and have it look more like the people that we serve, and the clients that we serve, um, we're, there's a pretty big gap there. We've got quite a ways to go. And while there have been improvements over the past five years, the needle hasn't moved greatly enough. And we still, 
we've got a long way to go before we really can achieve some of those aspirations. Yeah, and it's uh, those are really interesting stats. And uh, and if you haven't checked it out, the SC3 survey, I think there are some, I think it's available online uh, or at least on the website, uh, at least for the past surveys. And yeah, it's really eye opening uh, just to see what the industry is like. And like you were saying, yes, there has been progress, but there's there's still work to be done. And it's so important, at least to me, to to see it because now with social media and everything, you can see the faces of who's um, in engineering or who's in who's in science, and you know, people see that when they're going on LinkedIn or Instagram or, or or whatever. The people that you see, it's the programming that you're putting in yourself. Oh, this person, even though you're not not doing it on purpose, it's kind of the programming that you're putting yourself in. Um, like it shouldn't stand out like, oh, that person is, is uh, a black female and, and she's an engineer. It's, it's, I think you can, it's still like that where it's kind of like, oh, it's still a surprise where, why is it a surprise? Because, well, that's kind of what the industry is right now. And the more different diversity uh, that you can put into it, it's then, I guess it, to me, it wouldn't be as much as, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise, you know, it's, it should be diverse and people should be represented because it's exactly what you were saying. You need that, not just diversity, just because for sake of diversity, but the different perspectives that it brings people growing up in, in uh, different places, uh, different economic backgrounds, different countries, because the U S is, I mean, there's so many different cultures and the more you can represent that with diversity and their experiences, I think even your company is going to be a lot better because you can serve that much more, you can be that much more understanding of, of literally who the people you're serving in whatever a company that you're, you're going, go, that you're, that you're serving for. So I think that's great. Um, how has, Absolutely. yeah, I, that was, you know, that was my two cents. I think I would, that's great. I would also say really quickly, you know, I would also say really quickly, you know, what's so fun about this is that you and I are actually in those two minorities of that SE3 survey. You're, that you're part of that 23% that aren't Fully white that are non-white or are I, okay I imagine you took the survey and I don't mean to disclose your your <laughs> private answers that but I imagine that you answered that you were Asian or island Pacific yeah uh, I'm actually Filipino so yep definitely in that and yeah it's it's cool to see how you know just so just, just so you mentioned it it was uh you know on social media I get questions just to show you the impact of this the stuff that you're doing is is you know, I get questions from people international too about like just something that stood out to me was uh, a, a, f a female engineer, I think she was still in college or whatnot or in high school. And she asked me a question, I think she was from the Philippines and she was asking, hey, can I be an engineer too? Uh, I'm not sure if I can do it. And then like th those questions are being asked because they don't, they don't see it. Uh, but yep. with stuff like this, it was, then I would just go on a whole spiel about, are you kidding? Like half of my office is, is female. And I know so many female engineers uh, that are doing great work. And it was just like, they need that sense of belief or they need that, they need to see it. And that's why I think stuff like this is so important, not just in the US, but internationally. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I did want to get into, I know Gems Camp is, is growing so much. Uh, can you go over how the Gems Camp has grown over time and what can we expect in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So what, one of the reasons I'm also so passionate about this group is that um, it's, it's been around for a short while, but it has really gone through an evolution. Um, so we started in 2010. Uh, we've been incorporated since then. And it used to be um, our executive director, Saki Milton, has really dedicated her, her professional life to this. Um, at the time, she was doing this in her free time. She was still um, you know, working full time and she, this was a Saturday program for girls. So they would come together, they would meet um, in, you know, in a library or on a college campus where they could you know, receive free funding since it is a 501c3, um, so it's a nonprofit organization. Um, and they would just meet on Saturdays and they would do extra math and science tutoring and they would learn a little bit about STEM careers. Um, since 2010, it transitioned into a week-long day camp over the summer. So um, instead of a Saturday summer program, this became actually something that girls could do for the whole week. And they were there from, you know, eight to five. Um, they had a little bit more intensive studying that they could be doing. And that's when the curriculum really started to evolve to include things like 
mental, mental wellness and, um, and a little bit of physical wellness. They, they look a lot at like nutrition and how to um, take care of yourself, um, you know, different things that, that girls in that age group may not necessarily be getting from home um, or, or that are, are um, I would say, myths or misunderstanding about, about you know, how, how a woman needs to take care of herself. Um, there's also some things about financial wellness in there too, so these girls are prepared to then be able to manage their own finances when they, you know, eventually leave home, whether that's to go to college or, um, or otherwise. Um, when I started, we actually had grown into a residential camp, uh, residential program. So these girls are now spending the night at a college campus. And for some of them, it's the first time they've been on a college campus. You know, they don't necessarily have older siblings who are going to college. Um, and here they are staying in a dorm. And that's such an eye-opening experience where they get to see like-minded peers who are academically driven and they're living together and they're learning together and they have this community. And it really is the, this big community that's built um, from these even week-long camps are, are enduring um, and very impressive. And one of the things that we have seen since we started uh, integrating some of these residential programs is our retention rate is up to 90%. So we target girls who are rising seventh to ninth graders. And what we see is that we have girls who come in as a seventh grader and they're kind of like, oh, you know, I think I want to do STEM, but I'm, I don't think I'm that good at math and science. They spend a week with us they do this residential program, they meet other girls who are in it. Oh my goodness, there are people who also want to do this and they're my age. They're not, you know, wanting to be YouTubers or, or, or be social media influencers. Um, and they see role models that, that affirm, I can do this. Someone else has done this. And so then they come back for eighth grade and then they come back for ninth grade, which is awesome. So this actually presented us a little bit of a problem um, a few years ago, because now we had these girls who've been with us for three years and we don't know what to do with them afterwards. So we then added a separate program that's the STEM Pathways Institute, and that's for rising sophomores who are looking to potentially go to college. And some of these girls are first first time college students for their entire family. Um, so we're we're helping them prepare for resumes and interviews and college applications and essay writing and all of the things that you need to do to become a semi professional or try to get to that level. Um, and since 2019, we added on a new uh, program, which is a global STEM travel program. So a lot of these girls, like I mentioned, maybe they have never been on a college campus before. Several of these girls, right now we're just in, in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Um, these girls haven't left the state of Texas before. Maybe, and if they have, they probably went to Louisiana or Oklahoma. Like it's not like they're going very far. You know, they haven't, they haven't necessarily had the opportunity to see a lot of the world. So in 2019, I'm sorry, 2018, we took our girls to Italy and they got to see the viaducts and aqueduct systems. They got to learn about geometry and they got to, you know, see all of these things um, from a civil engineering aspect or, or a math and science, applied math and science context, to be able to put in all of this information that they've accumulated over three years. So they've been with the, they've been with the program, they've been to it multiple times, they, they're starting to really become robust STEM candidates. Um, and then they get to go and not only see how these things are applied and have been applied historically, they're also getting a cultural immersion portion. Um, in 2019, we brought the girls to UAE. So they actually got to go to Dubai. They got to see the Burj Khalifa, which I know all my structural engineers out there are freaking out about. I've never <laughs> been to see the Burj Khalifa, but you know, we brought, we brought uh, I think it was 12 or so uh, black and Latina girls from Dallas, Texas to go see the Burj Khalifa. And the amount of inspiration that that gives you. I mean, I, I'm thinking at least half of these girls are going to be structural engineers. That's my hope. But, <laughs> but that, I mean, having that opportunity that they just know, you know, they, a lot of people from their neighborhood don't necessarily get is, is eye-opening. Um, and then I think what's funny is, you know, 2020, we had this with these really big ambitions. And we're like, okay, we're going to double our programming every single year. We're going to go to Austin and Lubbock. And we're going to go outside of Texas. And we're going to do all these fantastic things. And then, you know, like everyone else, 2020 happened. Um, so we since had to pivot and make all of our only in-person programming virtual, um, which we did successfully. We expanded to two campuses. So we had two different colleges that kind of hosted um, or two different areas that hosted these camps. And we were able to actually expand, of course, because we're no longer re restricted to a certain room size or a certain number of dorm rooms. Uh, we were actually able to expand our programming to a larger number of girls over a large amount of time. So we're, we're really starting to see an increase in the number of girls that we can impact um, and 
and in the different ways that we can. So we're excited to get back to our in-person programming as much as everybody else is ready to be out of their house and, and go see other people. Um, but in the meantime, we're, we're putting in the work to touch as many people as possible through more digital means and, and potentially even you know, bringing the programming to them in one way or another. Yeah, the, the pandemic's not gonna stop you guys. <laughs> and Absolutely not. That's so cool. The, I think it's kind of like a mentorship program for all the different phases that you're going through, you know, from your seventh to ninth. And then what's, what's really cool is that travel one. That seemed really awesome. I think if you want to inspire people, <laughs> you take them to the, Absolutely. the Burj Absolutely. Khalifa. Well, it's not cheap. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not cheap to get to those places, but between the grant money that we raised, the, the, the corporate sponsorships we're able to attain. I mean, we, we, it's hard to pull the funding together because it's, it's not a cheap thing to run, but it's a worthwhile investment. Um, I also, you know, you mentioned that it's kind of cool that they, all these different girls get to come in different phases. One of the neatest things about the, the trademark GEMS camp, this week-long residential camp, is that the girls who have been graduated from the program, who are no longer ninth or 10th graders, actually come back and they function as a TA. So they're getting TA experience as like 11th and 12th grade girls in high school that they can then take into college. And in a lot of situations, we actually have college girls who have been through the program and they come back as well and they're like a lead mentor or they're running a portion of the camp. So we really see recruitment and retention throughout the entire pipeline to where our girls who have graduated continue to come back and continue to empower the next generation, which is super cool. So awesome. And yeah, it, it, I think that even gives them a leg, a leg up, like you were saying, because they do have that help and that mentorship, which a lot of people don't, especially if they don't have that type of that organization to where they can basically ask people for help. I know when I wasn't involved in, in stuff like that, it, it would be tough to be like, well, who do I, who do I ask? Uh, but if, if you have an organization like this, especially where you have like-minded people, like you were saying, it's, it's such an advantage and it, it brings more leaders and it makes more leaders uh, and the leaders give back. So it's, it's a great cycle. Uh, Alex, I wanted to ask you with, with these types of organizations, why did you personally uh, get involved in, in this? What was the driving factor? Um, I'm, I'm really passionate about empowering women and empowering girls. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, you have people reach out to you on social media that say, can I do this? Uh, I, I've been really involved in ACE mentor program for the past few years. And every year I find a girl or two um, who are in our program who specifically just you know, they, they, they kind of say, can I, can I talk to you separately or can I talk to you after today's session? And they ask this question, it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize there were so many women and you know, I didn't realize there could be so many opportunities for me. And you both do different engineering or, you know, they, they're still astounded that there's, a, that there's room for them in this industry, which is, it's heartbreaking. So um, I've been involved in a lot of organizations. I, I love to volunteer my time. Um, I think it's one of the most important things an individual can do is look to the next generation and help those who, who don't have the resources that you grew up with. Um, and I, I fell in love with GEMS because the program is so well-rounded because these girls leave transformed. They didn't come here to learn a little bit of math and science and then get ahead in the next school year. This isn't a college prep organization. This is really bringing girls this, this newfound belief that they can succeed. And I, hopefully I don't start crying. I have a really bad problem with that. Um, I've been to multiple of the graduation or uh, the graduations at the end of the week when they present a project and, and seeing them Monday of the week being shy, not looking you in the eye, not knowing how to write an email, not knowing how to like all these different things that we take for granted as adults. And they're, you know, they're, they're uncertain of themselves and they're a girl going puberty they're 13 years old everyone is awkward at 13 year old but these girls are under resourced and and they just have so little confidence in themselves at the beginning and you just see them blossom over the weekend and transform and then when they're at this graduation and they're excited and they want to talk to you about these things that they've had an interest in in a long time this, they didn't just start to like stem in a week they had an interest they just didn't believe that it was a place for them and when you see them on on that final day on that saturday morning and they're beaming and they're excited and they're enthusiastic and they believe that it's someplace where they can belong. It's just the most amazing feeling. And that's, it's something I get with a lot of organizations that I spend time with, but for me, that's really the icing on the cake. That's awesome. It's, 
I think I mentioned it before earlier is, I mean, you're really changing lives because you, once you instill that in them, then, and you give them the support system, I think that's so awesome because yeah, that they can look back on it and be like, Hey, that's kind of the point where my life changed. Someone believed in me and, and I got that support that I got. And then they can look back and hopefully they, 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 they find the same thing that you have. Like, Hey, someone did this for me. And you know, I want to do it for someone else. And it looks like with that high retention rate, I think that's awesome. You guys that, that you got going, I mean, it's working and it's really changing lives. Um, and I think that's uh, just another thing that I, I wanted to point out that, that caught my eye too was uh, it is still important in this industry because I went to, um, I think it was a, it was a structural engineering, but it was uh, for women and uh it was like a personal development program. And yeah, I've heard some of them too. Like they would say to me that I've been in this industry for so long. I didn't know other people or other women were going through the same thing I was. And uh, like you were saying, even though we had the statistics, some of, some of them are just in silos and they, they don't know that there are other people like them. And I mean, what's cool is that you bring this early on that you have a support system, no matter where you go, uh, you know, that you can find or talk to people uh, similar to what you're going through that have the same, that have the same experiences that and, and, and setbacks and all the things that you're going through. It's, it's so important to have that, especially when you're young and when you get into the industry. Um, I did want to ask, have, have you experienced professional benefits from being involved with GEMS? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, I, I think always that volunteering is one of the best things you can do as especially a young engineer, um, because it's first of all, when we have young students and they see an older person coming in to talk to them about engineering, they automatically dissociate themselves from the, the profession because they think, oh, you have to be very experienced. Oh, you have to be uh, much more mature. Oh, you have to have so many years of, of, of work before you can be in this position. So it is important that we have young faces coming into classrooms. Uh, working with younger kids to help um, establish a little bit more of, of understanding because you're going to be a lot better um, attuned to speak to those younger audiences than some of our older colleagues. So first, it's important that our, our young EITs get involved. Um, second, I think I can honestly say that I have learned so much from a board orientation within GEMS, not just giving them my time, but um, you know, being a one-to-one -one mentor to a student and then being on the side of fundraising and having to steer an organization that I've referenced in many interviews um, that have seemed to have gone well because I got the job. Um, hopefully they didn't say everything was great except for that one question. But uh, you know, I think from a perspective of being a young engineer, I'm, I'm only 30 years old. I've only been in industry for just shy of seven years. And this gives me a different avenue in which to exercise decision-making skills, um, mentorship and leadership skills, um, you know, giving back, uh, forward thinking, um, so many different different um, aspects that are very important when you kind of hit this this mid level, this thirty to forty range when you're looking to make that next step. Maybe it's your first step into management. Maybe it's your first step towards a larger amount of responsibility. Um, this is one of those things where you can say, "Look, I may not necessarily have had this experience in my work history and my and my roles at this firm." but I have exercised all these things. I've gone out to take initiative and learn how to master some of these skills on my own for a very good cause, which you know many, many uh, employers love to see as well that you are um, a member of the community and that you give back. Um, and I think the, like selfishly, the, the number of skills that I've acquired from, from being in leadership positions of GEMS has absolutely impacted my promotability and my critical thinking skills and my understanding of the greater macrocosm that is a business, an organization, a department. Um, when you are learning to steer the ship and make sure that you have enough resources and that you're putting people in the right places to succeed, um, all of those all of those experiences make you a much more valuable professional. Needless to say, and outside of that, I mean, I get to network with people from all different types of, of STEM organizations. So you know, if I if I wanted to, I have lots lots of contacts with different um, different STEM professionals, different other women from around DFW, from other large corporations. Um, there's all of those, you know, standard benefits you get from doing anything is the networking and being able to put it on a resume. But really, the breadth of skill and the depth at which I've gotten to ex execute those and then rely on them for my job has been 
huge. Yeah, it, what I like to say, and you, you mentioned it, it's, I mean, if you're looking at it from a professional development standpoint, yeah, the project management, I mean, that's for sure there. Uh, and you're not gonna learn that if you're just doing calcs all day. Uh, and so I guess promotability, like you were saying, if if you're, uh, if you wanna get promoted, that that's one way to, it's, it's like free project management training where the stakes yes, are low, yes, go ahead. Yes, that's exactly it. Go make, go make the mistakes. It's okay. It's not going to lose you your job, but you're going to learn those lessons early on without costing your company uh, money. So if you're talking about professional benefits. That's one of them too. And I think another one too is, at least for me, and I think you've already got it, was, is, is finding uh, fulfillment from volunteering. It's, if, if, if you're in the profession and I don't know, you may get bored with your job or something. Maybe you you lose the meaning of why you did it. I think if you volunteer and you help someone else, at least for me, it's it's really helped me out in terms of, you know, purpose and and finding fulfill, more fulfillment in your work because now it's not just you're doing what you're doing and you like what you're doing, but you're helping others succeed in, in that whatever area that uh, you needed help on. And I think professionally that can give you a boost too. So uh, great points there. And my last question is, what are some ways our listeners uh, can empower women of diverse backgrounds to pursue a career in STEM or engineering? Right, so this is how do I, how do I take action? Um, and I think one thing is of course, being an ally, that's always a great thing um, to do is make sure that you are positively um, contributing to the conversation. Um, that's, that's ground zero. We should be beyond that at this point in my own uh, personal and professional opinion. Um, it's great to say that you support these things, but we need to put a little bit of a little bit of action behind them. So um, I'm going to segment my suggestions to two groups. So one is um, if you're in, a, in a, a minority of these diversity groups. So if you're a woman, if you're uh, a person of color, if you're a woman of color, um, unfortunately, the burden is still on our shoulders to be the representation that these young folks need. Um, we really have the ability to be the turning point um, the density of, of, of diversity in STEM has never been higher, which is still sad because we're hanging around a quarter at best for any one individual group um, of the overall population. So it is still, it's still our responsibility to make sure that we are spending some of our time and investing in the next generation by letting others see that we're out here, that we're successful and that we are fulfilled in our careers. Um, because again, it takes that representation. It's, it's so critical that we have that. Um, so that's my first call to action is if you're in one of these groups, please give some of your time. If there's a one hour online uh, virtual panel that you can join that you got from your um, university or from uh, a, a professional group that's trying to increase STEM uh, diversity, spend that hour because it will pay back in spades. Um, the second group is if you're not in one of those groups. So if you find yourself in the majority in one way or another, um, it is not your responsibility to necessarily show up and give the time to be the representative because we need the representation to come from the people who are from these minority groups. Um, and it's not to say that you shouldn't volunteer your time to, to help others be excited about engineering. You should absolutely spend a day of e-week to go to your local science museum and, and get, get excited about engineering. That is a, a fantastic and noble pursuit. Um, but what you can do within the space of creating diversity within STEM means, first of all, educating yourself, um, learning to empathize with the world that others came from that we didn't, that you didn't necessarily experience yourself. Um, identify your own biases. There are a lot of online trainings. There's a lot of great articles that can help us understand where those lie. Um, and then after you identify your own biases, actively and intentionally work to reverse them in the workplace so that you're making a, a space of inclusivity and belongingness for your current um, colleagues who are either female or people of color, um, because that's part of the problem now is that even now some of our some of our work cultures aren't necessarily um, as inclusive as they may be, and it can be things that you have no idea what's going on. So um, awareness is, is a great first step there. Um, if you are willing to spend your time and don't necessarily need to be the representative in the room, join a board. Um, I don't necessarily need to be in the room for gems. It's great that they see a female, but again, like I mentioned, I'm not a person of color. Um, they need to see more people that who look like them. They need to see women who um, are of color, who are successful in their STEM fields uh, when they're in these different uh, programs. Be on a board of something. If you have time to give, 
help them get the resources they need. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of uh, volunteer effort. It takes a lot of leadership to make these huge programs, impactful programs work. Um, and when you spend your time to get them the right resources, then those people who need to be representatives can actually go do that instead of having to make the, make the ship run, make the whole program work and also be the representative. Um, so that's a great way to use your time effectively and, and make probably the most impact. And the last thing that anyone can do is put your money where your mouth is. Um, if you're listening to this podcast and you're a structural engineering professional, you are financially better off than about 90% of the rest of the, of the rest of the American public. Um, and putting 10 to 20 bucks a month to an organization is huge. And it, it makes a big impact to those organizations. Um, so it may be, you know, a sandwich for you that's given up a month um, or a lunch out with a colleague, um, but it makes a big impact to their bottom lines. So for example, for, for um, Black Heritage Month, uh, my wife and I actually both donated to NISBE, uh, the National Society of Black Engineers. I didn't participate in this be as a, as a college student. Um, you know, I, I wasn't a member myself, but um, we, we both gave to our alma mater's um, student chapters so that they had more funds to be able to include uh, and, and really empower black students at, at our, our alma maters. Um, and I'm including one final plug here, which is um, also give to these younger groups, these, these organizations that reach out to elementary, middle school, high school students. Um, GEMS does have a GoFundMe page. You can give a personal contribution. And again, literally anything helps. Um, but half, half of the problem that we see within our institutionalized barriers to, to many things like people of color come from the fact that they are underfunded, they are under-resourced, um, and they, they can have all of the best intentions in the world, but we all know that without a little bit of, of fodder, the fire doesn't grow. So um, if you can, if you have the ability to, the slightest bit from your pocket makes the biggest the biggest amount of difference to these organizations. Thanks, Alexis. I, I think those are some great ways. I think especially, yeah, awareness is probably the number one thing. If, you, if you're not aware, you know, make yourself aware. There's free resources online. And yeah, if you don't, if you don't have time to volunteer, exactly, uh, funds go a long way. And Alexis, before uh, we, you know, before we end, was there anything else that you wanted to mention about Gems Camps or, or any anything that I missed? Yeah, no. Um, I, I guess I just want to sh- send to our audience. You know, we we started in Dallas, Texas. We're here in North Texas right now. We are aggressively growing. And uh, my, you know, if, if you're excited about Gems and the work that we're doing. I would say keep an ear out, follow us on social media, and uh, there may be a situation in which we're coming to you very shortly. Alexis, that's all of the questions that I had today, but I really had a, a great time uh, you know, talking more about this. I know this is one of your, your passion projects, and, and it's really great to see more in depth on, on really what it's like to, about what this organization is doing and, and the impact that it's having on, on people's lives. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you and thanks for being on and it was great interviewing you. Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 46, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.